The term book slum or reading slum is such a niche term to a community of people who love to read books. And a reading slump occurs when you just feel like you're reading the words on the paper and they're just not flowing like they used to. You're used to opening a book and getting lost in that world, but now when you open up the book, you keep checking the time and barely a minute has passed and it just feels like drudgery to be reading. And I found myself in that place this week because I think I just read too many books in a row that were not doing it for me. And it makes you forget that feeling, that feeling. You know the feeling. It's just that feeling you get where you're like, this is why I read books. This is why I'm addicted to reading books. And I have not felt that in a really long time. So in this video, I'm going to try to get out of a reading slump. And there are two major things that I typically do immediately when I start to feel this feeling. And the first one is to read what you already know you love. And that is specifically very easy for me this week because two of my favorite authors published new books. So this is like, this is literally perfect. Lynn Painter, who wrote Better Than the Movies, came out with Happily Never After and it's a short book, which is even better. This is just a typical adult rom-com. The words are not gonna be hard to read. The storyline is not gonna be hard to follow. This is the perfect thing that we need. And then, even better, you know what? Let me go to my shelf and get all the books down. Holly Black, who wrote the Cruel Prince trilogy and also the connected spin-off series of the little brother from this one, The Stolen Heir. She just released the second book in this series, which is The Prisoner's Throne. And one of my besties, Destiny, sent me this gorgeous special edition of The Cruel Prince. It's like a velvet. So yeah, anyways, you can tell that I am obsessed with this series and the fact that there's a new book in it is also perfect. So I'm gonna start off with these two and then if that doesn't take me out of it, I have another trick up my sleeve. I got Happily Never After on my Kindle. So I will be starting this now. And I have a coffee in this gorgeous mug that my dad got me for Christmas. I found out recently that I was pouring like four servings of creamer into my coffee. So I'm trying to cut back. It's the next day and I'm on page 233 now. I don't even think there's 300 pages in this book, so I'm almost done with it. But as you can see, the cover, it's two people at a wedding with their hands raised. So basically the concept of the book is that at a wedding, whenever they say, does anyone object? This guy, Max, actually gets paid to object so that people who are stuck getting married and don't want to break it off themselves can hire him. And then he can object to them getting married and then the wedding gets called off. The circumstances can be like, cheating, your parents want you to get married so you feel like they'll get mad at you if you call it off or just different scenarios like that. Max is the one to call off Sophie's wedding and then they become friends a few months later and now they start doing it together. So yeah, it was a very funny, lighthearted, whimsical, not realistic start to the book, which is my favorite. I finished the book. I'm gonna give it three stars. It's fun, fast, no brain power, no thinking, nothing emotional. I will say, I love that Lynn Painter really sticks to a theme of like, if you wanna have a happy and fun time, you can count on her books to not put anything emotional in there, not even like a subplot of something remotely, like a real world struggle, which is sometimes what I really want in a book. So you can always count on her books to do that. Actually, wait, that's kind of a good point. I feel like that's true of all of her adult romance books. I don't remember any subplots of anything that was remotely emotional, but in her young adult books, I don't have better than the movies with me, which is my favorite one. There always are actual subplots of something very difficult, like in better than the movies, her mom passed away in the do-over. I actually don't remember what it was in the do-over. Something. In Betting on You, his parents are divorced and he's having to grapple with the fact that his mom wants to date new people. And there's a reoccurring theme of loving her young adult books. This one's five stars. Better than the movies is five stars. Betting on You is 4.5 stars. And then all of her adult books are three stars for me. I still think she's super talented at writing dialogue, at creating scenarios that are super hilarious and creative and fun, fast paced. There's never really a dull moment, but I also feel like in her adult romance books, all of the relationships are just super physical. And because there's nothing emotional in them, she just focuses on the physical chemistry and then I just don't ever attach to the characters. So even though there's some funny moments, I overall just don't really care about them and I'm not rooting for them to get together. So yeah, it served its purpose in this video of being just a quick thing for me to read to get myself back into the motion of reading, but I'll never think about it again and I probably won't really recommend it, but that leads us in to phase two. <laughs> We're diving back into one of my favorite series, The Prisoner's Throne by Holly Black. This one has actual politics in the fantasy world, so it's going to take using my brain a little bit, which will be more rewarding most likely. But this world, the world of Elfheim, is the most 
whimsical magical world I've ever read about in my entire life. As a kid, I really loved the Tinkerbell movies. I don't know if that's what they were called, but I just was obsessed and this series is like the closest thing I've ever read to something like that. It doesn't feel childish or cheesy or cringy or anything like that. Like it feels like a real complicated world full of politics that makes sense and you believe the dynamics between like there's actually a human world that still exists, but then there in their like fairy magical world, the fairies can't lie, but they're very tricky and everyone just wants something from you. And to be a human in that world is very difficult, which is what the first series kind of goes through. And then this one, which is the spinoff, follows the brother whose name is Oak. And he's always been heir to the throne, but he doesn't really want to partake in any of that stuff. And his whole family is dead set on keeping him safe. But I think in this book, we're going to watch him secretly take on something really dangerous. And so far it seems like he's gotten himself in a sticky situation. So I'm going to see how that gets resolved. I'm 48 pages in, which since being in a reading slump, going from one book straight into the next has not happened in a while. So, so far my little plan is working. Oh, I'm still recording. Hello. I absolutely demolished this book. So good. I followed Ryan on a mini tiny little quick trip to Boston. So I was able to read on the plane there and back. And this book is just so good. This is where I keep the rest of the series. But I just love this world so much. I feel like some people might go into this series not caring as much because it's like, oh, it's the little brother. It's the spinoff series. But I think the characters are just as great. This is about Oak and Ren. I love Ren. She has blue skin, sharp little teeth. She lived with a human family even though she's definitely not a human and she was always scared of them seeing her in her true form because she didn't want them to think that she was a monster and I just think her character arc is really realistic and something you can get invested in and Oaks is too. Like his whole character development in this book is that he always plays the fool to trick people into thinking that he is dumb and doesn't care about things when in reality he's analyzing everyone at all times and plotting different things that even his own family doesn't know about. And I wrote some notes in the back of the book about what it is about her writing and this series that I enjoy so much. I said, I like how their manner of speech is royal, but not hard to understand like old English. When I read books like this, it makes me think maybe I would really enjoy like a Regency romance or something like that. But then when I try to pick up those books, I feel like, well, I really shouldn't say anything because I haven't really picked up those books. But in my brain, it'll be like reading Pride and Prejudice where I just had such a hard time understanding the book, but they still talk like they're royals. And I just love, I love it. Like their little quips back and forth to each other where they outwit, outsmart and outwit each other is so good. And then I also wrote, the politics are all about making deals and betraying one another. A common theme I enjoy reading is wit in books, such as Red Rising and Throne of Glass. I'm trying to actually write down things that I like about books so that I can better look for other books that I would enjoy. And something that I finally figured out is that I love when you get to follow a main character who is outsmarting other people's plans in politics. It's just so cool to read because you feel like you're the clever one when you read it. That happens in the Red Rising series, which I love. And that also happens in the Throne of Glass series. Also a theme in these books. So I don't know, as I'm talking about it, it makes me wanna just change my rating to a five stars. But I originally wrote it down in my notes as like a 4.75 stars. But this is the thing, and this is why I've been in a reading slump. It's almost the end of March. It's been three months and I have not read a single five-star book. That is crazy. And I've read so many 4.5 and 4.75 books. And I look back at those ratings and I still agree with them because if you ask me the characters' names, I couldn't even tell you, which just goes to show if it was five stars, I would definitely remember their names. I always underline when it comes to these books because I love the writing. I also feel like in this book specifically, she just dropped some bars randomly, like some actual little tidbits of wisdom. I underlined this quote that says, joy is never guaranteed, Tiernan says, his voice gentle, but you can wed yourself to pain. I suppose at least in that there is no chance of surprise. Let me find some other quotes for you so you can understand what I mean by the kind of regency royal matter of speech, but it's not difficult to understand. 
This quote is so good. This is gonna talk about their relationship like the tiniest bit. So if you consider that a spoiler, you can just double tap once. But all that matters is that I do want you and I have you. Though that seems like a confession, she delivers the words like a threat. I thought you believed that there could be no love where one person was bound. Isn't that what you told Tiernan? You need not love me, she tells him. What if I did? if I do. Oak has proclaimed his love to people before, but that felt like play, and this feels like pain. Maybe it's because she sees him, and no one else has. The illusion he wears is much easier to love than what's underneath. Ren being the first person to truly see who he is. Okay, fine, five stars. I feel like also for a book to be five stars, you have to really sit and marinate, and I really like looking back at the quotes that I've been underlining recently because it just reminds me what the writing was like and the emotions I felt at the time of reading them. Because I feel like lately I'll read a book and then I just move on so fast that I have no time to even remember the fact that I enjoyed the book so much. I feel like this completely took me out of my reading slump because then on the plane, I still had two hours, so I got out my silly little romance book, Love on the Brain by Ali Hazelwood. I've read all of her books except for this one, and I got 90 pages into it after just finishing this one. So that is definitely me out of a reading slump, and I'm so excited to continue this book today. So far, the formula has worked. Quick, easy little three-star read, jump into a, a world I already know and love, and then just keep on reading books that I like already, I guess. There's not really a formula beyond this point because I think I'm out of the reading slump. So I'm gonna keep on reading, see if I still am. I'm on page 95, and I think I'm just going to sit here for a very long time and read this silly little book. It's a STEM romance book and in this one she works for NASA and her co-leader is someone who she thinks hates her. <laughs> it's actually so cute already. She thinks that he hates her and then she anonymous chats with someone online who we, as the reader, you totally know that it's him and every time she asks him like, oh, how's it going on your project? He'll respond and be like, she's still married even though she's not still married, her fiance. But we don't know what happened, what her fiance did, but he betrayed her in some manner and they're not together anymore, but he he still thinks that she's married so he stays far away from her and is cold to her to control his emotions around her. Little does he know or she know. Ellie Hazelwood just knows how to write angst, okay? I'm very excited to jump back in. just fell asleep reading and woke up. But I finished Love on the Brain by Ali Hazelwood. And if you paid me one million dollars to read an Ali Hazelwood book with a straight face the entire time, I think I would still fail. I caught myself giggling. <laughs> so embarrassing watching the footage back. I laughed out loud like three times while reading this book on camera. So imagine the times I was not on camera. I feel like so many people that I personally watch or even on Goodreads just did not like this book when it came out like two years ago. So I never read it. And to be fair, I think a lot of people didn't like it because at the time it was her first book after the love hypothesis to come out and they said it was basically just this book in a different cover. <laughs> and I think that is precisely why I loved it so much because I love the love hypothesis by her and it really is true. Like the two male love interests in this book are pretty much the same exact person, but he's my favorite ever. So the fact that I spaced it out for so long, it was like I got to read about the same couple that I love so much, but in a different city with different jobs. In this one, they work for NASA together. And another thing I will say that I love about Ali Hazelwood's books is they are so silly. Like the things that are going on are just so hee hee ha ha funny good old time. But because Ali Hazelwood herself is such an expert in whatever sciences she studied, I don't even know what she studied, but all of her books do revolve around women in STEM in some shape or form. And because Ali Hazelwood actually knows what she's talking about, she gets to give you such in-depth perspective that it makes the main character sound like they really are a scientist or a NASA expert or whatever they are. Whereas like if you read Happy Place by Emily Henry, the female main character in that book is supposed to be a doctor. Obviously Emily Henry is not a doctor, so she had to just interview someone to figure out, okay, like what's something general I can say about being a doctor, like working long hours. Okay, I can write about that. But it's not like Emily Henry has a firsthand experience to be able to write a character that sounds like she's actually a doctor, but Ali Hazelwood can, if that makes sense. So I feel like that's just another aspect that makes it feel very immersive. And I feel like I'm just always very invested in whatever subplots are going on in her books. Cause I feel like she does have a lot of subplots and they're all amazing. This one also probably has the most outlandish ending, but I don't care. My heart was pounding reading it. I needed to know 
what was going to happen next. I needed to know the myth. Like, we all knew what was going to happen. It's not like it was a hard to predict book. But I did not care nonetheless. She had me laughing. She had me swooning. She had me needing to find out how the conflict was gonna be solved, and it's five stars. It's so crazy because I went this entire year so far not getting any five-star reads, and then in this video, trying to get out of a slump, two books back-to-back, five stars. You can't play on that. That's so crazy. To be fair, I did read only from some of my favorite authors of all time, but the Lynn Painter book was still only a three star, but these two have a track record of being five star reads and they continue to be five star reads. So it's not like I can do this every week because it's not like my favorite authors of all time are releasing books every week. So I am nervous that I don't know what to read next and that I could still be in a reading slump perhaps. But after finishing this book, I decided to download a short story that is free on Amazon Prime. It's kind of confusing but I think Amazon hired a bunch of really popular romance authors to write short stories. There's one from Christina Lauren, Sally Thorne, Ashley Poston. Ashley wrote Seven Year Slip, which was one of my favorite books that I read last year, and she is one of the people who had one of the short stories. So I have Amazon Prime, so it was free. I just clicked download and then I put it onto my Kindle, and you can read them in like one setting. I think they're probably 40 pages or something. So as you're reading it on your Kindle, every time you click the page, it like goes up in percentage that you're almost done with the book, which is really fun. It looks like this right here. You can also get it free audio wise I think but this one was called with any luck and it was about our female main character who is best friends with her guy friend who's about to get married and she's actually the best man and then the girl who's gonna get married has a maid of honor that's actually her guy best friend but on the morning of the wedding the groom is missing so the best man and the maid of honor get together to go find where he is so yeah that was really fun I just wanted to read one of the novellas because I've kind of seen them going around everywhere and I love Ashley Poston so I figured reading her writing would be fun and yeah it was a fun good time I don't regret reading it. I feel like they're fun to read if you just have Amazon Prime and it's free. So I gave it like three stars, read it in like an hour, and it was a good time. One of my other tips for getting out of a reading slump is to switch genres really abruptly. So instead of reading fiction like I normally do, trying to pick up a nonfiction book. And I've been wanting to read another C.S. Lewis nonfiction book for a really long time. This one is The Problem of Pain. I got like 20 to 30 pages into this book two years ago and then stopped reading it. So I started it over again from the beginning. I'm only on page 16. I have my old highlights and my new highlights in here now. Oh wait, maybe I got way further than I thought last time. It's okay, it's good to reread them. His writing is not necessarily, it's not quick by any means. In fact, sometimes I read it out loud so that I can hear myself say it and then it's easier for me to understand because in this book, he's basically trying to work out a very difficult theological problem of if God is real, then we have the problem of pain, the problem of evil. And if God is good and God is love, how do both of those things exist? How are both of those things true? Obviously not a light little subject, so it is difficult to understand and you have to take your time and it's not something you just read in one sitting. So I don't think I'm going to try to read this fast by any means. I want to highlight it, make sure I'm actually understanding the points that he's trying to make. But yeah, every time I read one of his books, I just get hyper because I'm like, this is something I wish I could explain in my own words, but I have no ability to, but he actually has the talent of being able to write it out in a way that makes sense to me at least. So if you're interested in any of those types of questions, I recommend reading one of his books. And then I started this book, Half a Soul by Olivia Atwater. I was told that if you're obsessed with the Cruel Prince trilogy, you would like this book. And I've been trying to find books like that trilogy for my entire life since reading it. So I'm like 76 pages into this book not bad. I keep falling asleep while reading it because it's kind of a slower paced book, but at the same time, every time I look up, I've like read 10 more pages, so I'm not necessarily bored. It's just like a very relaxing, calming book. It is whimsical. It's definitely more of that like old English that I was talking about. It's just a little bit harder for me to read. It's not as easy as Holly Black's books are to read, but it's kind of my first time reading like a Regency romance, but it's also a fantasy with fairies involved and curses and all those sorts of things, so I am invested in the problem we're facing right now. Oh, it's only like 280 pages. That's exciting. Working on these two now, not going to finish this one in this video probably. But as you can see, this video has been a success. I've gotten out of my reading slump. Let me know a book that got you out of your reading slump and I will see you guys next on my vlog channel for a reading wrap up of the month or on my Instagram or TikTok or something like that. But thanks for watching this video. Bye!